I don't actually recall doing a lot of painting or drawing as a kid, uh, but I do remember uh, playing a lot with designing or redesigning things outside. So I would create spaces for toads and frogs and caterpillars and um, I would build houses with Lego. Lego and Tinker Toys were huge for me. So I think it's kind of interesting how um, how I played as a kid actually more informs what I do as a curator. Um, I, I did go to art camps and things, uh, but I was more into sports at that time, so it was those really physical outdoor uh, activities and camps that I enjoyed. I, the, art, the art camps were a little too um, laid back, I thought. I don't know. <laughs> and they were always asking you to do what they wanted you to do versus uh, real room for exploration or experimentation or, or play. You know, you were sort of always working to um, an assignment that they had outlined for you. So, I, yeah, that, I wouldn't say I, I was drawn to those sort of camps when I was young. I think it was really gradual. Uh, as I said, I did go to art camps, um, uh, and my mother was always dragging me to museums and galleries as a kid, which I don't actually remember, uh, you know, being um, mesmerized or knowing that this is where I wanted to be or what I wanted to do. Uh, I remember always getting the hiccups like really loud hiccups every time I'd walk into a museum or gallery. It was like if you had to be quiet in a space, all of a sudden I got really loud and it was, my mom was always really embarrassed. And I also remember setting off an AGO alarm because <laughs> there was a Rodin sculpture right at the front entrance and I put my hand in his hand and <laughs> you know, well, isn't that what you're supposed to do? And uh, set off an alarm. So I was I remember going to a lot of galleries and museums and arts festivals and things like that with my parents, but I don't, it, it was much later where um, I was influenced by the arts. Uh, I took quite a bit of um, uh, English lit classes in high school and a lot of these times they were asking us to design children's books and so I was uh, integrating my writing and drawing, which I really enjoyed. Um, and then I remember, um, so that was happening in both art class and English Lit, where we were asked to be designing children's books. And then there was a movie, and I'm not going to name the movie because it's really embarrassing, but there was this movie that had symbolism in it. And um, the, at the beginning of the movie, it shows this curator going to the house of an artist. Um, who she's trying to give him a show. He's an older artist, um, quite a quiet, uh, subdu subdued gentleman. And he's, he has just been fishing, and he's got this live fish sort of writhing on the end of a chain. And um, at the end, so she's managed to secure a show with him. At the end of the movie, you zoom in, he's having an opening, and the first thing they zoom into is a dead fish. And it really struck me that here are all these people at the opening, um, they're drinking, they're laughing, they're having a great time, nobody's looking at the art. The old man's in the room crying, you know, so he is this sort of, he was alive when he wasn't in this gallery space and now he's dead that he is, you know, so the work dies by entering into this arena. And I just really found, found that sort of powerful. Um, that people weren't paying attention and I, I don't know there's something about me like I need to make people pay attention you know to these artists and um, uh, yeah so that really struck me that and then of course I started reading Margaret Atwood and her writing just sort of comes alive visually so yeah it was, it was more language and, and, and film that sort of inspired me I think well, I think upon coming to Western, you can't, you couldn't help but be uh, inspired. I had a lot of great professors. Uh, I said I still have a lot of great professors. <laughs> They're still around. Um, uh, Helmut Becker uh, was one of my professors, and uh, he was our printmaking instructor at the time. And you know, his passion for stories and the narrative, and his attention to materiality of things, uh, his connection with nature. Uh, understanding how nature and the studio are connected through his materials, paper making, things like that. Um, so he, he was always a real inspiration. Um, uh, and uh, 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 Duncan, de Kirk, Duncan de Kirkamo was a professor at the time, so he's my painting professor, and he was um, 
you know, he was just very encouraging. He was just like, don't go and do more school, just get out there and paint. So, you know, he was really um, supportive in identifying that I should pursue my talent and maybe not get caught up in the so much school, but I, of course I went on to do more school. And uh, <laughs> um, I, I had Sheila Butler, um, I had Colette Urban, who's unfortunately now passed. Uh, all of these people were really inspirational in terms of showing me the variety and dimen different dimensions of art practice. Um, and, and David Merritt, uh, just, I didn't really have him during my undergrad, but I did have him for, uh, I came back and did a couple courses, and, um, but it's always been his work that's inspired me. There's something that's very quiet and profound about his work. Mm -hmm. And of course, living in London, Ontario, um, you know, love the uh, drawing aesthetics found within Susan Day's ceramics work. Um, Jeff Wilmore's Mixpedia approach to painting and drawing and collage is always, you know, there's some whimsy and, and play there that I've always appreciated, energy. Um, and, um, and then Ed's, I would say, you know, you hear about people standing in front of an artwork and being moved. The only artist who I've ever done that with is Ed Zelnick. Um, so, yeah, I'm about to get emotional. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so there's something uh, extremely personal and universal about uh, some of Ed's work that um, has become a personal goal for myself in the last few years is how can you do so something so simply that has uh, so much to say. And I think it comes down to his understanding of how important scale is and um, his understanding of materiality and the narratives that are embedded within materiality. And um, yeah, just, and, and his ability to edit, right? Knowing when to stop. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I've always really been struck by his um, uh, five, five sided shape series and his drawing with metal. Like, just he sort of has always pushed the boundaries of drawing and sculpture. So yeah, his work really resonates with me. I'd also say that in terms of, um, like for sort of from the curatorial, administrative end, like I've always, you know, being in London, uh, there's always been powerful women in mm -hmm. the community um, uh, in leadership roles, which you don't find that everywhere. So uh, Arlene Kennedy, uh, Catherine Elliott Shaw, um, Melanie Townsend, um, Jewel Goodman, there, you know, there's, there's always been these sort of great female role models in this community in terms of the uh, business side of arts as well. Uh, Madeline Lennon, like it's just, yeah, it could go, and on, go on and on and on. Um, so I feel I've been very lucky in, in seeing that modeled for me and uh, women who um, have had positions of leadership and yeah, great creative practice. Okay, so I'm extremely impressed by youth today. I did, was not thinking about a career when I came mm -hmm. to London. I applied to three art schools. Um, I, was, I received entry into Ottawa. I think I received entry into all of them. I was interested in London because I had some friends coming. It was close enough, far enough away from home. I grew up in Pickering, Ontario. I was a big enough, small enough city. You know, it was sort of these wonderful in-between transition spaces that I felt I could function in. Um, I'd also been uh, accepted into Ottawa. Um, I kind of shied away from Ottawa because of that French requirement. I wish I'd done it now. <laughs> but um, I remember driving to Ottawa for my interview and they held the entire thing in French after I drove five hours in a heat wave. And I don't, I remember being very unimpressed. <laughs> I just, yeah, but uh, I, I think London was, it, it sort of had a little bit of everything to offer. and. Um, with some of my friends coming here. Um, I was, as again, I was still an athlete, so I was looking at uh, playing volleyball competitively while I was here. So all of these things came into it, but I wasn't necessarily thinking, I need to go to London for the arts, but what I found here was not you know, a very vibrant arts community that um, actually found was one of the founding sort of artist run centers of the, of the nation. So it was, it was wonderful that there was such a rich community here. I think challenges as an artist are challenges that everyone has. Um, you know, the whole idea that 
We live in a culture where uh, success is determined by wealth, and what you own and how much you earn. Um, that when you're doing what you love, <laughs> uh, that always is a struggle. So trying to find the balance between sustaining yourself or sustaining your family or household and uh, pursuing your passion um, and being able to find different types of value or worth, worth in that. Um, but I think everybody struggles with that. I, and um, you know, it, it, it's sometimes being an artist is not a choice for, you know, I would say that being an artist and a curator, it's been a very, it's been a choice and I've had the privilege to choose that. There's some people that that's what they are and they don't have a choice. And so um, in knowing that I could, you know, go off and, and do an administrative job and, and you know, um, or, or do something that, um, do something that what I wouldn't consider play, you know, like really is work. Um, um, I don't. I just feel that. Um, I think everybody makes those choices, and uh, some are thinking, some are thinking uh, about their life in retirement. And I'm. I don't know if it's selfish, but I'm. I'm like, no, hold on a second. I have friends dying heart attacks. At my age, I have people dying on the 400 every day, and so you know, when people ask me what I'm doing, I'm like, well, I'm enjoying life today. Um, I'm not living my life for retirement, so I'm living it for today. Um, so, you know, when you look at what's going on in the world today, there's days where I, I I'm actually, I get quite, um, uh, I really question the role of art, to be honest. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't have one. Uh, it's, you know, art is, is used to teach. Um, you know, we're even now learning through the medical community that it's actually preventative medicine. Um, and uh, so it's, it's leisure, it's joy, it's therapy, it's, um, um, it's education, it's political, it has, it has all of these functions. There isn't one function, it has multi-functions and everyone who uses it or enjoys it um, embraces it for a different reason. Um, its role today, uh, there's a, there, I'm currently researching prescriptive art practices. This is art practices that are actually making the change that they want to see. Um, I've primarily been doing descriptive work uh, throughout my history. This is where I'm describing what I see. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm researching prescript prescriptive art practices. To me, this is um, an extra value art can add where um, if soil is contaminated, you know, there's artists who are planting gardens with uh, cabbages because cabbages end up cleaning the soil. Oh. And so they'll do these decorative uh, designs in the soil um, and they're working with scientists. This to me is very exciting. Um, uh, there's other artists who are using their textile history to um, clear out invasive vines out on the west coast and then work with a community to crochet them to create um, soil, prevent, soil erosion prevention nets. Um, so these are the practices that I, I think that are sort of taking that extra step. But there's also a lot of art activism right now that is um, extremely important as well. Uh, that's drawing attention to some of the social inequity issues. Um, um, so you know these these things are these things have a lot of power right now. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty instrumental for me to go back and do my MFA. Mm -hmm. um, it was a long time coming. Uh, I had been I started off with figurative figurative practice, uh, identity, sexuality. When I was in my undergrad here. There's no room for that in London, Ontario. So, in terms of a, a market, mm -hmm. you know that. Um, and so, my work quickly changed to landscape. It doesn't mean that it ever left the figurative, because I think I always knew that our environment and then our bodies were are, are highly connect, interconnected. But 
Um, so I, I quickly moved into landscapes, and my landscapes, you know, moved in and out of being very political, uh, to talking about environmental issues, urban sprawl, um, uh, talking about the context of land, and um, but I was trying to sort of um, play that crazy line between commercial and conceptual, and the the work wasn't fitting anywhere. <laughs> And so I knew, I knew that I needed to um, go back to school and take the time to um, push the practice to where I needed it to be. And so I pushed it to the conceptual, which was, which was hard because you end up leaving quite a bit of your art practice behind and a commu different community behind as well. Um, so yeah, I feel that my work has moved more into the conceptual. It's less about production, more about process. And um, um, moving towards the slow and and unmaking and moving towards the small, uh, all of you know. I think I, I come into huge sort of awareness about my presence as a um, colonial settler, past and present and future, right? Um, and um, so, what does that mean as a maker, producer, consumer? Um, when excess is continuing to sort of serve as an iteration of colonization. So I'm trying to minimize my output and my footprint on the land. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all leaving your mark. Well, um, there's all this controversy over monuments and things like that. So how do we actually start to reduce our mark as artists? How, how can we create and give back and not leave as much of a mark? So that's where I'm going. So um, this video is called Undoing, number one, and it was really sort of my first uh, venture into unmaking as a creative act and um, coming into relation with material, not just in its form, but also its constituent parts and the value that we can find in constituent parts of things that we're constantly throwing away or discarding or give, uh, you know, giving away. Um, and so it was coming back into connection with these materials. I'm about to find new value in these materials. Um, so this is the first stage. The second stage was untwisting, number one. The third stage will be carding, number one. So I'm going to card out the wall and then uh, yeah, and then the, uh, the fourth one I'm going to leave is a surprise, but this will be a four-stage unmaking, mm -hmm. and um, how long that takes, you know, and the labor that's involved, and what comes out of those um, different recordings. I found out that the sounds that were produced during this undoing actually served as ASMR for people. I don't know if you know what ASMR yeah. is. You do, but it's it sort of it everything. yeah, it's sort of a, mess, a euphoric massage of the brain. And so the whole fact that I could unmake something and it was still creating something mm -hmm. for someone else, which kind of which was kind of interesting. Um, so uh, right now I am I'm exploring unmaking, and I specifically is unmaking textiles because for me it served as a metaphor of I need to unmake the trauma that I know is attached to the global textile industry and fast fashion. Um, you know, I've come to this sort of belief that if there is trauma, environmental, social um, uh, trauma on, as part of our production chains, we're actually consuming that and maybe even absorbing that. Um, it's been proven that our bodies can absorb pesticides. And so if we are, if there are people with trauma on the other end of our consumption, are we actually absorbing their trauma as well through their DNA or, and things like that? So I, that's sort of where that came from. Also as a, you know, despite me uh, reading uh, decolonization is not a metaphor, <laughs> uh, which I'm also really starting to take to heart um, in terms of giving back the land. Um, um, this to me was sort of a, a, um, also another gesture of how do we decolonize um, our thinking, um, our consuming, our making. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it kind of is a metaphor for that, <laughs> but um, um, I, but it, it, to me it really is about getting to a point where we're not continuing to colonize land through waste. I've recently j I've been given two public art gallery exhibitions, um, which to me, um, 
they ultimately this was evidence that I'd sort of made the right choice in going and returning to do my MFA and pursuing my PhD. Um, and the work that I was able to show at the McLaren Art Center in, um, in Barrie was very personal work. It was about um, my grandmother passing, and so it was very intimate work for me. It was, it's almost complete opposite of all the sort of global narratives. So that was extremely um, meaningful moment was that I was showing in a public art center space um, with another with another female artist, Tanya Kind, who I, who I really treasured the work she was showing, and that um, I was just able to do really personal, intimate work, and that 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 was good enough. You know, there was something that. Um, um, again, it was one sort of one step closer to Ed Zelnick's work, where the personal can be enough, um, and it can resonate with people uh, in a much, much wider way. Right? Loss is something we all experience, and uh, so that was yeah me working with my grandmother's afghans that she had knit me, and as well as um, stitching out her letters that she had written me over time. So yeah, it was it was, it was both personal and profound in terms of having sort of my first public art, sh art gallery show. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, I actually thought back to my fourth year at Western and a lot of it was textiles. Uh, I did a quilt, I did a soft sculpture, created these giant soft sculpture rolling pins that people could hit one another with. <laughs> um, and it was, it was uh, from a feminist point of view, um, more than a material point of view. Um, so looking at um, uh, women's garments and women's uh, craft and uh, commenting on sort of ro gender roles within a relationship and power struggles and things like that. Um, and so I've actually been doing it a long time but just from different maybe perspectives mm -hmm. and even in with my landscape work uh, I was stitching textiles into the canvas talking about mending um, um, Pattern. Um, so yeah, I've been I've been using it in many different ways. Um, of course, I've always been a fascin you know, drawn to fashion, and um, so uh, when I started to sort of really research that, um, that became really personal really quick. So really needed to start decolonizing my closet. I'm lucky in that I've made the move to slowing down the artistic practice that you know I'm not producing um, m series of works for um, an art fair or a commercial show per se anymore um, so and because I've also started taking up knitting and crocheting everywhere can be the studio so if I'm in the car if I'm in front of the television uh, you know this this can serve as studio time, which is great. Um, and, and the balance of the teaching and the curating, I see I see the curating as research mm -hmm. now. Um, I, I, I thought they were separate. They're not. Uh, but that might be because I've gotten to a point where I'm really focused and know what I want to do mm -hmm. and know what I want my practice to do. And so now my curating, and now I'm an independent curator, so I'm not curating for... Um, a, a center. Now I'm curating for myself and so now all of these things can yeah. come together. And um, so the curating is now research for my practice um, and then the teaching I'm actually designing, working on designing a course that will communicate my practice and research. So to me I've gotten to a place where this can all come together and it, it's all important and actually it's like okay what do I need to do today there's no balance I don't schedule anything yeah. <laughs> it's like what do I need to do today yeah I don't know it's interesting because I don't I think I've always done research as I've been working um, what I and I don't know if I actually believed in practice led research right. until <laughs> my MFA and then mm -hmm. and then I was like whoa this is this is this is um, this is powerful revelation, mm -hmm. and it needs to be shared, yeah. and it needs to um, be promoted. So, um, through printmaking methods uh, during my MFA, it actually revealed sort of 
um, it was able to actually communicate back about the material textiles I was working with. So um, the darker the print, the more absorbent the fabric was, which then pointed to uh, um, whether it was a natural fiber or a synthetic fiber, um, which then ends up talking to its use of natural resources on the end and how it'll break down, or sorry, natural resources at the beginning and then how it'll break down at the end. And so the fact that my printing was um, was able to speak to those different cycles of production within the textile industry was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And then um, I had also been doing these double prints, which, and when you open them up, it, it, well, they ended up, I was printing fabric or clothing, and it ended up looking like body parts. And so then that to me was like, hold, you know, this is showing how our bodies are materially connected to. Um, what we're wearing to what's on the ground and because they end up looking like fossils so these fossils of lungs fossils of of the um, uh, clavicle like the, uh, the rib cage it just or livers like they were all these sort of fossil like impressions and I just it, it to me it really confirmed this whole that we're all part of the same material cycle and what what is today will actually be land of the future and so what are we putting into the land and we grow food off the land so we're eating what's on the land, you know, so I just, to me, that sort of, um, pl those playful experiments ended up leading to a lot of, um, yeah, realization, deeper understanding of things. Awesome. One of, I think, my earliest uh, concept, or uh, environmental series of landscapes was uh, from me moving from London, Ontario to Barrie. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the opportunity to fly and in a helicopter from here to there and I could see the suburban sprawl and the loss of farmyard and also was able to see the amount of machinery and stuff piling up on the rural landscapes um, and so this was you know and, and you're also able to see how the urban and the rural connect or butt up against one another and so uh, again, it was like realizing that this landscape out here is actually probably more important than <laughs> the urban um, and it's important that we preserve it. Um, and you know, you can't help but become aware of the, with Monsanto and like all of these things, they're actually contaminating our soil um, and contaminating our food. Um, um, the Nestle water. Um, there's just too much in the news to ignore it now, um, but I think it was about 2010 where I just became extremely hyper aware of how important um, agriculture and our rural landscapes were and how we needed to preserve those. I, as I said, I don't think I see my curation and teaching as separate parts from my practice anymore. I think they're all part of my practice. Um, there's days where I've questioned, <laughs> uh, maybe you should focus. Um, uh, and to be honest, I think um, I'm just too passionate about other artists and what they're doing mm -hmm. to, to leave that curation behind. And you know, even students, teaching students, and being inspired by students, um, maybe helping students navigate the art world a little easier than I did. Um, I took a long time to get to things or arrive at things. Uh, and so, yeah, just being able to help mentor artists who um, have a goal or, or not quite sure how to go about doing things and uh, yeah so that I think they, they all bring value to, to what I do. Um, it's actually really hard for me to go in the studio right now mm -hmm. so in terms of making and producing. So right now I'm in the process of unmaking old canvases mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, reconfiguring them so um, because I the whole idea of creating something new is, uh, is I can't do it at the moment. Mm -hmm. I went into my MFA knowing I wanted to change my work and as soon as I got into the MFA um, uh, I, I felt t two years isn't long enough to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Do all the coursework, um, then experiment and play and then reflect and somehow um, produce this you know, prolific and, and profound thesis work. Uh, but yeah, it's been huge. It's been huge. Um, I, I, I was talking about the environment and textiles within my MFA. 
I was still doing what I would consider descriptive work, uh, data visualization, data manifestation, um, uh, trying to visualize sort of uh, the trauma that's attached to the fast fashion industry. Um, and sort of had a crisis in the middle of that, right? Like, oh my gosh, I'm an artist and I'm contributing to this excess. Um, so, but had to just push through there and knew that my PhD would help me get to where uh, I needed to go with my work. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, the structure I need. Um, um, it's my driving force, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. I don't get to see m much of what's going on in London anymore, but I just, just in being in and out of uh, Kingston and out of Toronto um, and very involved in the Barry Arts community, um, I am, I am um, just taken back about how sophisticated some of the young artists' work is that's coming out of programs. Um, you know, a lot of us work a long time to get to um, the level of sophistication that some of these young artists are working towards. And the discourse has definitely changed, you know, the discourse from the, I was in my undergrad in the 80s and only did my MFA in 2015, so the discourse uh, has drastically I shouldn't say drastically because that's a negative word, but has uh, really changed up, which has been eye-opening and uh, required me to catch up quite quickly or try to catch up. Um, so that's been as much the learning curve for me as even trying to transform my own practices, understand the new types of um, discussions that are happening um, and what voices are coming forward and uh, um, and celebrating those voices and the room that's being made for those voices. Uh, so yeah, it's it's been quite exciting. Um, I the the commercial market is um, um, again there's some exciting things happening there, uh, but I'm also seeing a lot of big Toronto commercial galleries close, and so you see artists even older than me now without galleries, and I think that's a really scary for some people. They had worked their whole lives to get a gallery, and now they're without one. And so, you know, there's something there's something happening there that's um, interesting mm -hmm. that needs to be looked at closer. Um, it could be a, a result of, you know, the larger issues that people aren't consuming mm -hmm. um, the way they used to. So, who know, Who knows? Yeah.